Hi everyone and welcome back to Neuropsychology. So in the last video we talked about implicit memory and about emotional memory, which are two of the parts of long-term memory. In this video we are going to talk about short-term memory and then after that we will talk about the limbic system in some more detail, about transient global amnesia, uh, herpes, simplex encephalitis, Alzheimer's disease, and then lastly about flashbulb memories, long-term potentiation or LTP, and some other causes of memory loss. Okay, so let's start off with short-term memory. So short-term memory, um, I often actually call it working memory. It is a neural record of recent events in their order. So we mainly use short-term memory systems to hold sensory events or movements and also cognitive information such as words, names, um, items, etc. for a pretty small period of time. So for short-term memory, the temporal, parietal and frontal cortices are really important. So short-term is said to be around 30 seconds and you can only hold up to around seven items. In a study um, in monkeys, researchers were looking at the brain pathways of vi uh, spatial visual, visual short-term memory and also of object recognition vision short-term memory. So what they found was that cells that code for spatial vision are located in area eight of the premotor cortex so right here and um, whereas cells that code for object recognition are located in areas 9 and 46 of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex so then other researchers um, wanted to study this in the human brain and they use pet scans and mri scans to demonstrate similar function anatomy relations in humans so there was an increase in area eight so right here when participants needed to search for an object that they had to previously remember. And then there was a higher brain activation in area nine and 46 when participants had to remember objects that were identified sequentially. So all this data suggests that there are separate systems for short term spatial memory and short term object memory. Okay, so um, moving on from short-term memory, let's talk a bit more about the anatomy of um, the brain structures that are super important for memory, which is the limbic lobe or the limbic system. So we previously, um, many videos ago, we talked about the limbic system very briefly, but it contains more than just the amygdala and the hippocampus. So the limbic system actually includes the amygdala, hippocampus, also the septum, which you can see right here, and the cingular cortex right here, the fornix, um, also the hypothalamus, um, and other things like thalamus and the olfactory bulb. But there's more components to it, but for, just, for now, just remember these. And it's really important for emotion, learning and memory, and of course, spatial behavior and social behavior. Okay, so this is technically what it looks like dissected, and now you're probably thinking like, okay, this does not make sense. Where does this go in the brain? Okay, so this is what it looks like in the brain. So here you have the entire brain, and in the middle you have the limbic system. So these structures are embedded medially in the brain. Other people often refer to this as the fifth lobe or the limbic lobe. So they would say that we have a frontal lobe, a parietal lobe, uh, temporal lobe, occipital lobe, and a limbic lobe. Okay, so there is a specific flow of information within the limbic system. So first, the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the prefrontal cortex will send information to the hypothalamus, which is right here. And then this, these little structures called the mammillary bodies, which are in the hypothalamus, they send their information, oh, where's my mouse? They send their information through the thalamus towards the cingular cortex. So this green brown looking structure is the cingular cortex. And then the cingular cortex will connect back 
to the hippocampus, to the amygdala, and also to the um, prefrontal cortex. So this is the process or the flow of information within the limbic system. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about memory impairments. So memory impairments result not only from um, diffuse brain damage, but also from brain diseases such as transient global amnesia, uh, herpes simplex encephalitis infections, and also Alzheimer's disease. So let's talk about the first two. So um, concussion, migraine, hypoglycemia, and epilepsy, and also an interrupted blood flow from um, can form transient ischemic stroke or embolism. They're among many possible causes of transient global amnesia. So you can describe this disease as loss of old memories and an inability to form new ones. So this condition is acute and has a very sudden onset. So it's really scary when it just suddenly happens. Transient global amnesia can be temporary um, and it can be one time, but some um, long-term memory loss can be permanent. But often people can recover from transient global amnesia. Okay, um, in, herp um, in herpes simplex encephalitis, patients often have temporal lobe damage, which will be accompanied by their severe memory impairment. So often this tempor temporal lobe damage will result in um, anterograde um, amnesia. And if patients have additional damage in the lateral temporal cortex, the insula and the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, they will also have retrograde amnesia. Okay, so Alzheimer's disease is also one of those neurological diseases um, that cause long-term memory impairments. So that this disease exhibits both progressive loss of cells in the brain, and also it will develop some cortical abnormalities. So doctors often call this the protein misfolding disease. So as you can see in this picture right here, there is a lot of atrophy or cell death or loss of cells um, all across the brain. And two other characteristics um, of Alzheimer's disease is that cells kind of clump together and they form these amyloid plaques. And, neuro and in the neurons, um, there will be formation of these neurofibrillary tangles. So if you compare a normal brain with an Alzheimer's brain, you can see all these strange amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles in neurons. So obviously there's a lot of memory impairment in people with Alzheimer's disease. And a lot of research um, is being done right now on this disease. However, still a lot is not known about this disease and there is no cure or treatment for it. Alzheimer's disease, um, the first characteristics of it are anterograde amnesia. And then later patients will have retrograde amnesia as well. So among the first areas of the brain to show histological changes in the medial temporal lobe um, or medial temporal cortex, but as disease progresses, other cortical uh, areas will be affected as well. So the pattern of brain change and the pattern of memory deficit suggest that damage of the medial temporal cortex is related to anterograde amnesia and then damage to other temporal association and frontal cortical areas is um, related to retrograde amnesia. So Alzheimer's disease-related amnesia is displayed mainly on tests of explicit memory, but eventually implicit memory can also suffer. Okay, so how are these beta amyloid plaques created in the brain? So um, this amyloid precursor protein, or also APP, is technically the precursor of these amyloid plaques that are everywhere in the brain in someone with Alzheimer's disease. So these APPs, or these proteins, will stick through a neuron's uh, membrane, and then an enzyme will cut the APP into certain fragments including the beta amyloid, which you can see right here in green. 
So these beta amyloid fragments will then come together and they will create these icky big plaques in the brain. So often when all these plaques form, this will disrupt the communication between neurons or neural communication. So this will affect um, especially the hippocampus, but also other areas of the cerebral cortex. Okay, so I wanted to talk about um, some healthy but interesting type of memories, which are flashbulb memories. So an example of flashbulb memory is, for example, your wedding or remembering when your child was born. So flashbulb memories are a type of autobiographical memory which are very emotionally arousing. So they could be either very positive or very negative. And what's cool about these memories is these memories are in way more detail than most of your memories. So they are kind of like vivid snapshots of the moment. And you can kind of transfer yourself back in time and remember all these little details about the moment. However, even though these memories seem way more detailed, they are still far from complete because they're very emotional um, arousing. So examples of these flashbulb memories are remembering the time, place, date um, of a car accident you were in, or you can even remember what you were wearing or things that were in your car. You can also remember specific details about the moment your child was born. Or, for example, remembering what you were wearing when you proposed or um, your significant other proposed to you. Okay, so another important topic I wanted to talk about that is not in the book, but I think it's really important, is long-term potentiation, or LTP. So LTP is a process by which synaptic connections between neurons will become stronger when they are frequently activated. So LTP is thought um, to be a way in which the brain changes in response to experience. So it is therefore a mechanism underlying learning and memory. And specifically, LTP in the hippocampus is the basis of memory. So there are four important steps in LTP. So first, a synapse needs to be repeatedly stimulated. And due to this repeated stimulation, it will put more dendritic receptors in the postsynaptic membrane. Then there are signals that will travel back across the synapse to stimulate um, the presynaptic cell to release more neurotransmitters. And all of this will make the synapse stronger and more likely to be activated in the future. Okay, so let's go over those steps one more time. And I um, took some pictures from the internet kind of explaining this. So whenever a synapse is repeatedly stimulated, so over and over and over again, then the postsynaptic dendrite will embed more of these dendritic receptors at the postsynaptic membrane. Um, then eventually there will be a message going back to this, um, the presynaptic cell, and that cell will start releasing more um, neurotransmitters because there are more receptors. So we more neurotransmitters. So that this will result into a stronger link between the neurons. Okay, before we end this chapter, I wanted to go over some other causes of memory loss. So here are three and then I have one more slide with a couple more. Um, so poor health can also result in memory loss and this is often linked to stress. So specifically, vitamin B deficiency symptoms include depression, confusion, dementia, and also poor memory. So always make sure you eat enough vitamin B. Severe stress and unhappiness can also cause memory impairments. An excess of this hormone called cortisol can impair the ability of the hippocampus to both encode and recall memories. So these stress hormones are hindering the hippocampus from receiving enough energy by diverting glucose levels to surrounding muscles. Chronic stress can also affect the brain structure um, and eventually also cognition. And 
Alcohol, we all knew this, but alcohol also impairs memories. So it technically works by slowing down your nervous system and it inhibits CA1 and CA3 neurons or pyramidal cells in the hippocampus. So you will have trouble creating or encoding new memories. So here you can see um, an axis with stress and memory and how they're related. So if you have low stress, it's actually good for memory. So it will increase your memory abilities. So then here you have the good stress or what we call you stress. And then if you have too much stress, your memory will start being impaired. Other causes of memory loss are PTSD, head injuries, or addiction. So PTSD has effect on the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex, and it causes issues with converting short-term memories into long-term memories. So you will have trouble in memory consolidation. Head injury can cause all kinds of impairments, but specifically damage to the hippocampus, amygdala, thalamus, or um, these other structures, will cause also memory loss. And addiction also causes memory loss and goes hand in hand with stress and poor nutrition. So addiction will technically interfere with memory consolidation. And then also, whenever you recall memory, um, you will have trouble reconsolidating that memory. Okay, so this was the end of this video. And I will see you guys back soon for the next video.